Okay, do you think we should get started now? It's um uh it's now 3 uh 38 p.m. in Singapore. Yeah, let's get the show on the road. Okay, so again, a very good afternoon to our participants. Uh just one second. Hi. Okay, very good afternoon to our participants. Um, Shirley Chu from the Cocoa Association of Asia again. And thank you for joining today's webinar titled Logistics, Finding a Way Out. So this webinar is organized by the Cocoa Association of Asia, a leading trade association representing the interests of the cocoa and chocolate trade since 2004. Uh, and in partnership with Henry Barth, a specialist in global commodities, warehousing and logistics. And together with our guest panelists from Stonex Financial, Darren, uh, and this event is moderated by Bar Talks. Uh, now, with continued uncertainties over border restrictions in China, uh, crisis in Ukraine, and other issues affecting uh, global trade flows, our distinguished panelists will offer their insights on how the market has responded to the crisis. We'll share, they will share learnings and solutions and risk management measures that have evolved to tackle the crisis head on. Now, we will first start with a 10 minutes presentation by uh, Robert Hohalson, Director of Agricultural Products Asia at Henry Bar. And then for the rest of the session, the panel will discuss and attempt to address questions asked by the participants ahead of the webinar. If you have additional questions, please do enter them at the Q &A, in the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom of your screen, and Katie will review them. And please note that the webinar is being recorded. I have questions coming in if this will be shared. Yes, it will be, uh, only if you fulfill the, the survey form at the end of the webinar. So um, now let's welcome our distinguished panelists for today. We have Robert, Director of Agricultural Products Asia at Henry Bath. Uh, everybody's on the screen, the panelists. We have Elvin Lee, Chairman of the Cocoa Association of Asia. We also have Penelope Ma, Business Development Manager at Henry Bath, Singapore, currently based in China. Currently, uh, she's currently in China. Stephanie Lockley, Logistics and Shipping Manager at Henry Bath, EMEA, located in Liverpool. And Darren Stetzel, Vice President, Soft and X Asia at Stonex Financial. And your moderator for today is Nick Basket, Editor-in-Chief at Bar Talks. So without further ado, I hand the floor over to our speaker. So Robert, over to you. Thank you, Shirley. So, welcome everybody. <coughs> so, we'll, the, um, is the slides on? Right. So, thank you again. Welcome. Welcome everybody to this webinar organized by uh, CAA in partnership with Henry Bart. I would like to extend a special thank you to Shirley for bringing us all together and making this webinar happen. Before we start, we would like to share a quick poll with everybody and to get an idea of your expectations with regards to the current supply chain issues. If you would take a minute to answer the poll, then we can, uh, which will be shared with you now. This, this is the poll, please, please uh, answer the question if you can. I think we will wait a little bit for the, for the results to come in. Okay, so it looks like we have now about 83% uh, of the, uh, of the uh, participants that have answered the question, so we can end poll. Yeah, what is the, looking forward to see the results. Okay, more than one year, most people more than one year, but still quite a large percentage who thinks within this next six to 12 months, it will be, um, it will get better. Let me um, start the presentation. And then uh, after the presentation, we will look again at this um, at the same poll question. 
So some of you might be uh, familiar with Henry Bat, but for those who aren't, I would like to give a short uh, introduction to our company. Henry Bat was established in 1794 in Wales as a copper trading company. Over the years, it has been involved in shipbuilding, is a founding member of the LME, and since January 2016, Henry Bat is 51% owned by the Chinese state-owned enterprise, China National Material Storage and Transportation Corporation, or CMST, and for 49% by energy trader Mercuria. CMST is China's largest integrated logistics company and is a major Shanghai Future Exchange and Dalian Commodity Exchange delivery warehouse operator. CMST owns more than 70 logistics distribution centers and operational facilities in more than 30 major Chinese ports and cities and possesses over 10 million square meters of land across China, including bonded and non-bonded warehouses in the Shanghai port areas. In 1995, Henry Bat has started to be involved in the handling of various soft commodities, including cocoa and coffee. Henry Bat is approved by ICE to warehouse and issue warrants against the ICE cocoa contract, the ICE Robusta contract, and the ICE Coffee C Arabica contract. We are also approved to store and handle both oats and organic products and can offer options for bulk and specialty commodities. In the Asian region, we operate, operate warehouses and provide logistic services in Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, Taiwan, and China. In these locations, we handle a variety of commodities, all managed by our own specialized teams on the ground. Now to move on to the main subject of the webinar and the reason why you have taken the time to join us today. The current logistics situation and what to expect going forward. It has been discussed many times already, since the onset of the pandemic and the situation has evolved quite a bit and keeps on evolving. The general sentiment for container freight in 2022 is that it will be extremely difficult landscape to once again navigate. We expect port congestion in the main ports to remain high and freight rates to remain elevated compared to the pre-pandemic levels. Black Swan events such as the invasion of the Ukraine and major lockdowns in China continue to fuel worldwide congestions. We are, closing, we are closely watching the impact of interest rates due to changes in the central bank's monetary policies. The elevated freight rates still need to be separated in headhaul rates versus backhaul rates, as the two markets will operate separately. Port congestion remains a major issue. Although we saw an improvement at the beginning of this year, Especially the sanctions placed on Russia and the recent lockdowns in China in line with its zero COVID policy have caused for an increase in the port congestions in European and Chinese ports. The port of Shanghai is still operating, though at considerably lower productivity. Lack of dock workers due to restrictions are impacting loading and unloading. Additionally, limitations and delays on trucking do affect container availability. To get around the disruptions, Shippers are shifting their cargo to nearby ports, such as Ningbo and, and um, ocean carriers are omitting Shanghai calls. Short term, we expect con to continue easing of the congestion in various US East and West Coast ports, where the number of vessels waiting to board has decreased considerably compared to previous months. This improvement is backed by measures taken by various governments to solve the congestion, this in combination with slowing of demand due to the ongoing inflation and less cargo arriving from China will allow some ports to catch up and resolve the congestion. Freight rates remain very unpredictable. We're, we're, we're at the end of 2022, uh, early 2000, uh, sorry, end of 2021 and early 2022, we were still confident that the rates would decrease before the end of 2022. We are now looking at sustained elevated rates to well into 2023. There has been recent easing of prices. However, in absolute numbers, these drops seem to be considerable. But when we look at the relative change, it's in line with what we would expect at this time of the year. We hope to see continued reduction fueled by a lower demand caused by the higher inflation, coupled with increased interest rates. This lower demand would also help to ease the port congestions, which would again have a dampening effect on the high freight rates. 
In the ideal situation, carriers will then be forced to reduce their freight rates and start to compete again for cargo by offering lower freight. The high earnings of the carriers has allowed them to invest in new capacity, which, is, which will start to come online by 23, increasing the supply of space while demand might remain even or even reduce and as such lower the freight. How long will it last? This remains a big question. We might be able to give a timeline based on what happened in the past. We would look at solving port congestion and the freight rate at two separate, although interrelated events. To get a timeline to resolve port congestion, we can look at the congestion caused by the labor dispute in North America in 2005. Once the ports became fully functional, after the issues were settled, it took about six months for the congestion to be resolved. And this was only in North America. Whereas now we are looking at a global event. As for the freight rates, we can look at the sharp sustained drop we have seen in the past. Between 2015 and 16, there has been a sustained drop in freight rates caused by a price war between the carriers. This took about 12 months. Today, there is no Im immediate reason for the carriers to start the price war. On the contrary, it's in their benefit to keep the prices rise high, where they are now for as long as possible. We could therefore conclude that even with lower demand, it will take more than a year for prices to come down to pre-pandemic levels. China, China's largest city, has experienced by far its largest outbreak of confirmed cases since the start of the pandemic, prompting strict virus containment measures from the authorities. A total lockdown in Shanghai was imposed at the beginning of April, and though restrictions are already being relaxed slightly, the full impact on the supply chain is still unfolding. Shanghai port remains operational, but is congested with cargo unable to move out of the port area. This especially concerns rivers and specialty cargo such as dangerous goods. Major carriers have started to inform their clients to ship or divert the cargo to other Chinese destinations or markets to avoid congested port. Some of that congestion is rippling out to other ports with ships being diverted further north to ports in Qingdao and Tianjin, where trucking services have not been impacted as much. Finding a way out of the current logistic impediment is more a question to keep an eye on the risk than being focused on getting lower freight rates. One of the bigger risks today is previous mentioned zero COVID policy in China and how big the ripple effect of the current lockdowns will be going forward. Once the lockdowns are over, and port activities can return to normal, the accumulated cargo waiting at the ports, factories, and warehouses will be shipped and can cause new congestion in destination ports, regardless of the easing we are currently seeing. We think the way out is to have a long breath and ride out the wave by absorbing high freight rates and keeping an eye out for known risks and future black swan events. Thank you again for joining this webinar. And before I hand over the floor back to Shirley, we would like to ask you to fill in the same poll as you completed at the beginning of the presentation to see if you have altered your, your opinion after, the presentation, after our presentation. Previously, we had about 42% of people who were looking at uh, six to 12 months, but, and the majority to, um, for more than 12 months. I wonder if, um, if we, we get similar results or, or different results. Okay, now we, we have 68% of people who have just responded. We just give everyone maybe a couple more seconds to, to quickly respond to uh, the relaunch of this poll. Yes, 70, okay. Yes, 72%, come on. A few more. Yeah, a few more. Uh, we currently have 72%. At least let's try to aim for 80% and then we launch the results just to see if people's mindsets uh, minds have changed <laughs> after your very nice presentation. My, but <laughs> my, po my positive story. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we... Uh, oh, oh, it's, uh, oh, it's climbing, it's quickly climbing. Wait a second. Uh, more people are like, excited to respond now. Okay. So we have about 75% of people responded. Uh, should we end poll? Okay, so the results. 
Ja, <laughs> big change. <laughs> so, sorry to... Uh, <laughs> Your barrel. This, this beautiful <laughs> story. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, Shirley, I would like uh, like to give the floor back to you. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Robert, for insightful sharing. Very interesting results, as we can see. I now hand the floor to Nick Basket to start the panel discussions. Uh, Nick, ready? Over to you. Great, thank you. So, I mean, clearly it was very interesting to see the disparity, the, the change in, in attitude uh, from the beginning to the end. And I think Shirley sent around some questions in advance to people to, you know, to what's really on people's minds, what kind of questions do they want to ask, what do they want to get out of the, out of the presentation, the webinar, because a lot of people came back and just said, well, when's it going to end, right? But there's so many different data points to take into account because we're seeing not just one macroeconomic crisis, but several. We've got the, we've got the um, inflationary pressures, we've got COVID, we've got now the, the, the Russian war, and any one single one of these would, would give a trader a headache. You take all three of them together and it, it almost becomes voodoo. But the important thing is to try to establish some data points. And I think one of the most important data points everyone's got the eye on right now is it's actually what's happening in China. So what I'd like to do is because we've got, I say we, Henry Bath has got uh, a person on the ground over in Shanghai. Um, I'd like to maybe just just pass the floor over to Penelope for a second, just to give us an update on on what the status is there. Sure. Thank you, Nick. Hi, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Penelope. I'm based in Shanghai at the moment. Actually, I'm stuck in Shanghai at the moment. So the full lockdown started from 1st of April in Shanghai but parts of the city could be traced back to lockdown from mid-March or even beginning of March. So most of the people right now, 26 million, are still locked in their house. They're not allowed to go out. And even we are reading on the news, some business are resuming, but the companies were saying, we are not able to get our workers back to the business park because the lockdown is still in place. So at the moment, as Robert shared, the Shanghai port as well as the Bangde Zoo are still operating, but definitely at a much slower pace than normal. So Harry Bus, as well as our parent company, CMST, we have placed some measures in advance before the full lockdown to let our colleagues or some of these workers to work two shifts within the zone. So they are not coming out of the bounded zone. So in this case, when the full lockdown happens, it doesn't impact us or companies within the zone area. However, the inland transportation is severely disrupted. Even after 20 days, we are not seeing any improvement in terms of movement within the city or moving the cargo outside. Because all the lands, all the roads in Shanghai and also the highways around Shanghai are still blocked. They do not allow trucks to move in and out freely. And truck drivers are very reluctant of coming to Shanghai because they will be facing lockdown. And also when they are going back, they will also face quarantine. So this is what we see. The situation is not seeing any good sign of improvement. Cargoes are piled up at the boundary zone and couldn't be moved out and to reach their end users. And any of the exported goods, they can't reach Shanghai port and it needs to be transferred to some other ports. So major ship liners like MSC, Musk, they have diverted their vessels to nearby ports like Ningbo, Tianjin, Qingdao, or even to South Korea. They just don't want to be caught in the congestion here as the, the picture Robert showed earlier. And any of the BL, they couldn't be delivered to the bank or to the ship owners. So this is the major disruption we're seeing even after 20 days. So back to you, Nick. I'm just wondering if, we, if there's going to be anybody positive or optimistic on the call. So <laughs> we've just had, we, I feel like we're on a downward slope here. So um let's just talk about maybe some let's lead this into maybe more of a not a, a positive direction so you know the serenity prayer if, if anybody's a stoic philosopher out there talks about uh let's let's focus on the things that you can control rather than the things that are outside of your control um 
I know that Robert, you, we we talked uh, earlier about the um, the investments that potentially some companies were making or going into improving infrastructure because that's going to be key in this, isn't it? And I just wondered if you could maybe just touch on on what changes are happening at some of the ports. Uh, as, was it yourself or Stephanie actually uh, who's going to talk about that? But let's talk about some of the the changes that are happening, the infrastructure that and when they might come into effect and and what kind of uh, impact that might have going forward so that we once we do finally get out of this we we can see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel yeah sure thanks Nick. so the um, the 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 carriers they have been making very decent money in the last uh, last year two years we we all know that we're all aware we've all seen it in the news and this has been invested in um, in new um, uh, new ships new carriers and these will come on online in 23, 24, which will increase the, the supply of, of space and uh, therefore should reduce the, the freight rates. And that, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, coupled with, uh, with the inflation we're seeing at the moment, which, has an, uh, which will reduce demand, that, uh, that should, uh, should reduce the freight rates. But it will, take, it will take time. And it's time that some people might not have. Right. Uh, so inflation. Let's ask the question on inflation, um, because obviously there's there there's perhaps a slightly more uh, understood metric for us to to look at than 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 the COVID pandemic. But as prices increase, um, what are the what are the models? What do we expect to see in terms of demand? Um, uh, and how are how are companies dealing with that? So most of us have have seen the shrinkflation, as I think Alvin used the term the other day. So the shrinkflation where we all go and buy our bar of chocolate and notice that something's different about it, what's changed. The packet's the same size, but there's just not as much chocolate inside. Um, so so we've got uh, we've got a, a reduced demand either from lockdowns and, and businesses that aren't operating. Airports um, are, are a major are a major a source of, uh, of, de of of pull demand for for the commodity, and when those aren't working, that that impacts demand. So as we see demand potentially drop off again because of these these uh, these um, issues, where did where does that how much impact will that actually have? Will that can potentially move the needle in terms of the in terms of the shipping and the the, the congestion that we're seeing, or is that just a, a drop in the ocean? If you if you would ask me, the um, inflation will will reduce demand normally. Governments, although, are changing interest rates to to fight the inflation. Um, um, unemployment is still at record levels, uh, so people are most of people are have a job, will keep on working. Therefore, I stagflation is not going to happen just like that. Uh, governments obviously will do anything to avoid that. And therefore, I think we we might see a reduction in demand, which would actually help with um, with the freight rates, because right. ports will be able to 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 resolve congestions. Uh, liners might be able to to remove their equip to move their equipment, which we're seeing already. We're already seeing uh, some carriers moving equipment from the U.S. back to China. Now that these some of these container vessels might now get stuck in Shanghai, but that we didn't know at that time. Right, right. Uh, so let's talk about shipping lanes actually for a second, because this is one of the key things when I, I saw in your presentation, the disparity, and it might be worth actually pulling that that slide back up again, because and we were looking at earlier, there was the, the forward haul and the, and the back haul lanes and the, the way that those prices had changed. I think it's worth just touching on that for a second and, and explaining quite how much the forward haul has changed. Can someone maybe throw that that slide back up? My yeah, great. So that's it. Well done. Is that Katie? Thanks, Katie. <laughs> so yeah, the head haul. Uh, so what we're looking at here, Robert, right, is the 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 head haul, um, the head haul uh, uh, last year is in green. This year is in blue. Versus the back haul, we can see that the that the 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 prices have kept relatively. Um, in 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 match to each other. Um, so can you just maybe put some context around that or some color that a little bit? And maybe, yeah. yeah. Sorry. 
So um, what we put in here is we, we focused on um, from uh, China, East Asia to uh, North America, East Coast and the other way around, knowing that a uh, lot of the, the chocolate and the cocoa beans are going into, uh, into this, this direction. So we see the, the, the huge disparity between last year's head hole and today's head hole. So going from East to West, uh, where it's about um, what six times higher. And mm. the interesting thing is that the back hole remains, like you mentioned, relatively the same. Now, don't be don't be fooled by the big changes you see for between back and head hole, because you have to look at it uh, in the percentage. So these are all all numbers, right? So of course the changes look very big, but it's it's only a few hundred dollars versus a few thousand dollars. Right, right. I'd like to bring Alvin into conversation because I know Alvin's got. Uh, you know, we talked about it before. It's got a lot of um, interesting things to say, in particular about this subject. And uh, you know, in the conversations we had, we, you know, you've talked, Alvin, about the. I don't know. I guess we talked about potential how this might change people's thinking. So, are people when you look at these changes in prices and the fact that it's not going to go away next week? This is, this is, uh, this is going to take at least a year or longer realistically to unfold how is this affecting people's decision making companies do you think uh and i guess particularly in the space of of what brings us together here right I, cocoa right. And chocolate, yes yeah 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 no it's a it's a good question i think you know one of the things obviously is when you when you look at the hit hall chart so people who have chosen to set up manufacturing out here uh, are now at, at a somewhat steep disadvantage, right? Because I think, you know, one of the other charts, obviously, when we look at processing, you know, the fashion has been to move processing to, to origin, right? So, so where the cocoa is being grown. And, you know, if, if we were to pull up a chart for, say, West Africa to Europe, West Africa to, to North America, you will, you will not see the same um, numbers as, as what you see here on, on the hit hall chart. So it just means that other producers of, of cocoa products and, and, and chocolate have become more competitive vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, the industry that sits here in, in, in Asia. Now, does that mean that people who, who have put money down on, on, uh, on the table uh, back up their factories and, and, and shift all their processing capacity somewhere else? Uh, no, because right? you know, factories, factories uh, that are set up are not so easy to just back up and go. And, and you know things like the approvals that, that you have to go through to get your factory into the books of some of these multinational customers is also a fairly lengthy process. Uh, so that's not going to be a knee-jerk reaction. But what it, it could do on, on a more long-term detrimental side uh, for this part of the world, obviously, is it, it, it could potentially reduce the interest to put uh, investment to expand capacity or, 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 or capabilities out here in this part of the world if you know you are reliant on a certain um, fixed percentage for exporting, right? Like mm. we are in 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 the uh, in the cocoa pressing business, right? Where where a significant percentage of cocoa butter, for example, still has to be re-exported out west, where chocolate is still the more dominant um, product and taste. Yeah, indeed. Okay, super. And we've got a question as well. Uh, I've just seen pop up here. So with this COVID restrictions easing, you mentioned that there will be a rush of vessel vessels to destination ports. Which are the main ports that could be affected? Hands up, who wants to take that one? It's going to go back to Robert by default, if I other, unless Stephanie wants to step up to the plate. <laughs> to throw you under the bus there, Stephanie. I, I would expect, and it might be a cliche answer, but these are the European ports and the US, the East West Coast ports. And uh, I would say more to the to the US, uh, mm. that uh, production in the in the area. There's a lot of electronics, and um, which will go there, uh, <clears throat> and the timing of the time of the year. Right. There's a there's a mass on the electronics side. There's a massive uh, uh, backlog. You can't buy anything at the moment because it's uh, it's all backlogged. So okay. Um, so. But picking up on on um, a, a further question we had earlier on, which was, if you do have a problem with your with your shipping, your cargo stuck somewhere. Someone asked this question. If your cargo stuck, how do you get it priority? What do you do? How do you get that moving again? 
make time for this one? <laughs> Go on, Stephanie. Okay. Um, so a lot of it is based on your relationship with the carriers. So that's your key, um, your key issue here. So that's where your contract versus your spot rates comes into question as well. So if you've got contract rates with the carriers, you know, you could be paying higher than the usual spot rates, but you are guaranteed space most of the time on the vessel services. Not always, you know, you do get the odd rolling, but you can. Now, what do you do in the situation where You've just got a spot rate. You, you're a smaller trader. You've only got one container and it's stuck. So if you're a small business, I mean, does this work? Can you build up relationships? Does it make sense to, 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 to work with a partner like yourselves? Or do you, are you, should you build up those relationships on your own? Henry by ourselves, we have the contacts with all the carriers in most locations. Um, as I say, we've got warehouses in global locations. So we do have agents in each so we do have agents in each um, region that can speak to the carriers. We also have those relationships. So if you did, if you did get stuck and you couldn't get it on um, a service, then we've been known to be able to speak to the carriers and to be able to use our relationship and get your container onto our contract to be able to ship and get things moving for you. Okay, so it's still a re it's very much a relationship business, is what you're saying. It's it's not all a computerized you know do it online and then forget about it like your fedex or whatever yeah no definitely right not. yeah um so vinit's got a question in the in the chat he asks is there a way to fix freight rates while still keeping open the option if it goes down so i'm actually trying to think well when you when someone says option to me i don't know whether they mean like option as in trading option or option as in you know the 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 um the ability to choose so if there's a way to fix freight rates while still keeping the option if it goes down is that a question okay. do, do you think for darren or who, who is that for yeah you can um i'll, I'll chip in i'm not an expert on uh, hedging freight um but you can hedge freight rates on the exchange so there are products available on the futures exchange to be able to hedge um so it's possible um i know Vinny very well so you want to have a chat about that option separately then i'm happy to okay i, super. I, I can add on to that as well i think i think it's a, it's a combo solution to that 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 issue as well right i just put on my my old procurement hat here um <laughs> You know, I, I think part of the problem why we are where we are as well is that, you know, when people looked at freight rates going up in 21, very few people were keen to lock in anything on a long-term basis, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that everyone had to rush through a tiny little door at the same time towards the end of 21, you know, really gave, um, in combination with a whole bunch of other factors, obviously give it that, that boost, right? And, and it's every procurement manager's biggest nightmare, right? Like, how do I lock in myself to basically record high rates and how am I going to answer my boss in six months' time if it suddenly collapses, right? And 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 it's a fair question, and it's 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 not an easy easy one to answer. But you know, I think I think in the current environment where you have a lot of unprecedented and, and simultaneous black swan events, you know, a bit of protection, uh, you know, always comes in useful, and you you can do that, you know, via exchange uh, products. But I would also say that you know, old-fashioned long-term contracts, you know, albeit at these higher rates are not a terrible way to go, but you just don't do it for 100% of your needs, right? I mean, if you want to participate in the, in, the, in the downside potential, you leave something open and you say, you know what, if, 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 if it hits the fan, then yeah, at least I got 30%, 40% covered at, at a lower rate. And then I'm still better off than, than the market. And more importantly, I may be better off than my next door competitor. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't think there's an easy solution here. Otherwise, we all wouldn't be here. Um, but I think there are some sensible old fashioned ways, if you will, to, 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 to navigate these, uh, somewhat murky and muddy waters. So it's, it depends on your risk appetite, doesn't it? Then is what you're saying. So if you've got a high risk appetite, you know, let it, let it, let it roll. But if you, if you've got a lower risk appetite, um, then maybe lock in the certainty, even if this at a higher price. After the poll, I don't, I'm not sure you want to let anything roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said risk appetite. Maybe you got a big, yeah. I don't know, but you're right. Yeah. Look, yeah. it's, it's, we, we don't think it's necessarily getting, get, going to get easier anytime soon. Um, and I, I mean, that, that picture of those containers outside of, uh, outside of China, uh, or the, sorry, those ships outside of China really drive home. They say a picture, you know, worth a thousand words. Well, you know, there's a thousand ships out there. Um, I think says it all. So uh, we've got another question here from from Ewan. Uh, what change, if any, has Henry Bath or indeed any other panelist seen in terms of cocoa or coffee volumes going into Russia? 
Well, that's an interesting one. Uh, I actually have got something to say about that, but I'm going to leave it until the panelists want to, to dive in. Anyone want to dive in? Okay. Uh, well, I, we wrote a story about that, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was something like, I'm going to throw out a number, which is probably going to be wrong, but I think it was like 13% uh, or, of, or maybe it was 13% of the coffee market was going into Russia. I think it was. It, it was something like that. And I know that Nestle have pulled uh, their coffee products um, from, from, from Russia. Uh, I also know of some ships that have had problems um, because, of potential, because of the potential sanctions of, of getting in. Got a question here from David Dubois, who says, are you expecting, I like this question, are you expecting to have less consumers to buy chocolate due to the inflation and high price of shipping and petrol, et cetera? Uh, if that's correct, then what are you expecting the price in to be in the next six months? So there is our crystal ball question. Uh, what price is chocolate going to be? How is inflation? How much are, I guess the question maybe is just to shape it a little bit, is are chocolate companies willing to eat into their margins? Or, you know, where does the calculation happen? Do they just pass on all costs? Do they, uh, do they accept margin erosion? Um, so how much of that's going to be passed on to the customer? Alvin, why don't you feel that one? Yeah, well, this is one of those questions where I always say to people, if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be sitting here with uh, all of you guys. I'm <laughs> yeah, doing this on my rich. own, right? <laughs> um, no, look, it, it's it's an extremely fair question. Um, I, I think we have an an adage in, in cocoa and chocolate that says, you know, that the product is relatively um, inflation, recession, uh, you know, shockproof in that sense, right? Or shock resistant. Um, I think it's going to be tested like never before, simply because, you know, unlike some of the previous shocks we've had over the last couple of decades, you know, this is one where it is just pure, you know, overnight hyperinflation, right? As a result of, 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 of several black swan events that have, have just been unleashed on us uh, almost uh, simultaneously. So it is going to be a, a, a key uh, a test, a litmus test here, if you, if you will, for, for the, 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 recession, the resistance, if you will, of, of consumption. Um, I think in the short run, certainly, right, because I think you've seen the price of staples, you know, all kinds of staples, food staples, you know, energy staples, all go up, you know, at, at, at very eye-watering percentages virtually overnight. And, you know, I think as one of my, my uh, global uh, trading lead here in Cargill says, you know, Joe Public is going to really reel from that, you know, as a knee-jerk reaction, right? And your discretionary spend, which cocoa and chocolate is a fairly, you know, uh, discretionary item for most households, is one of the first things to go or cut back on, right? Um, I think the other interesting thing that will obviously impact the consumption or the, the demand numbers is you touched on it earlier, which is shrinkflation, right? Because the ability to pass on price increases to, to consumers um, in the supermarket shelves is an area where a lot of FMCGs typically don't want to, to try. They don't want to test that out, right? And so the answer becomes to inflation, right? Put less in a bar, make the bar size smaller without you know, visually not affecting the, the consumer's impression. But as a result, you know, everyone consumes less, right? Although they think it's at the same price. So I think eventually the barometers for measuring demand, you know, be it in the numbers, be it in the pricing, are, are, are going to have to come down. Whereas yeah. the magic price, I, I think the question may have been asking for a prediction on a terminal. I think that's always a, that's always something that makes people look very foolish, uh, you know, six months, six days from now. So <laughs> to stay out that one. You know, that's the professional job of economists and yet economists never pass, get it right. Like pass that one to Darren. Darren, Darren <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> oh, we're not making any friends on today's call. Well, <laughs> Darren, have you got anything you want to say from a trader's point of view? Um. Yeah, I, th I, th I think probably, I don't know if these questions are going to come up a bit later, but two of the things like I've noticed, uh, especially during COVID and the current freight situation, um, uh, we used to trade a lot of OTC products. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, um, there's a lot of like structural products so you can tailor um, the contracts and hedge against COCO it's essentially on your own terms, so you're not tied by the futures exchange contract um, rules. 
So you can fix dates, um, accumulate swaps over certain periods of time. So there's all these exotic products you can trade. Um, and before COVID, they were probably one of the most popular products that we were trading every day. And now, especially in the cocoa sector, uh, we rarely, rarely do that much on the structural product side. Um, so the risk, seen a considerable drop in the risk appetite. Um, I think during COVID, uh, that was the result of kind of factory closures when COVID spread through factories um, and lots of different things. Like a lot of customers got caught out and lost a lot of money on some of the structures that were working. Um, so they just completely backed away from it for some time. Um, and it's exactly the same now with the freight. No one really knows about the flow of the product. Um, so that, that hasn't picked up. So we're still seeing like safer bets on the futures and some swaps and options, but um, more than one customer has been chasing the market on a number of times and had relatively large margin calls. Um, one or two have got nearly caught out. Um, so everyone's playing it a lot safer at the moment um in the market so it's not as exciting as it used to be but people are playing it a lot safer um compared to a year and a half two years ago um i think the other thing we discussed previously was um we're hearing that a lot of the especially in coffee which tends to kind of lead the way um there's a lot of build up of stock at ports um so I think it's risen for the first time since like August last year and it's expected to rise further. So if people's projections are correct and they expect this to continue for another year, we could see, normally this is in grains first and then you see a knock-on effect um, in other commodities. Um, but if the, if the stocks at ports continue to increase, obviously the price will come down because um, there's more in storage. And then we're hearing rumors of um, people selling their product back various commodity products back to uh, where they came from. And obviously during um, the last year, we saw oil go into negative t territory when that happened. So uh, for me, that's one thing I would firstly just keep not a close eye on, but monitor um, because we've seen it already happen in oil. And I consider that could be a bearish factor for um, the market that people might not be considering at the moment. Yeah, it's interesting, and that kind of goes towards a question we had also uh, in the in the panel from from Stefan as well, who was asking, I suppose more on the cocoa side, whether we're starting to see processes holding physical cover, and uh, you were mentioning that people are now the the stocks of coffee are are um, are, are full, and it is really having to maybe consider starting to send those back, uh, which is causing another logistics issue. But on the cocoa side, are we, are, are you, do you think that's following um, the coffee, uh, the coffee trend, or is it a, is it a different, a different scenario there? I think the, the first route, the first stories came out of the US. Um, <coughs> so that's, yeah. So obviously in Brazil, there's been, there has been big congestion for a while out of Brazil of shipments. So I'm not completely sure what the situation is with, um, like cocoa is obviously grown in Brazil and coffee as well. Um, but it's, it's a developing story for sure. So it's just something that's just starting to emerge at the moment that more people in the market are talking about. Um, I think it, it's worth mentioning when you uh, were talking about the flows into Russia. Um, we obviously do a lot of physical products as well. And our policy is anyone related to Russia, um, they currently go through a very strict compliance um process as you can imagine but the one thing that highlighted like the one thing that was highlighted to me was uh, we have an office in poland um and it's more the sensitivity to the staff in those offices as a global company um and how to best treat them and how to best assist them and those around the polish office related to our business so that kind of the ethic the ethical situation in our in our company specifically with a decent presence in Poland is uh, something that mm. is definitely affecting how we operate in those regions in that region okay super thank you and, and I'd also say I'm pretty sure aren't there there's numbers available uh, Stefan uh, from I believe from uh, is it IC has the has uh, uh, warehouse numbers that they release um, on cocoa 
So yeah. what, what, what I would like to add to this is that um, the, the, the cocoa stocks and also coffee stocks, we see, we see them, especially coffee, we see at origin. And what mm -hmm. we have seen in um, late, uh, late December last year and the first quarter this year is different ways of shipping uh, coffee. Uh, traditionally, it's being shipped in, in containers. But, and we, we discussed this right. previously, depending on what you put in a container, if you put coffee or low, relatively low value commodity, and I think cocoa beans uh, goes the same, uh, rubber would be the same, um, then your price for freight versus the value of your product is huge difference. If you put electronics, it's, it's different. So for shipments of coffee, we've seen a lot of uh, break bulk shipments going from Brazil to Europe, from, from Vietnam to Europe. And so exporters and, and, and traders, they are looking for other ways to ship their commodities. And for if you speak for coffee, we haven't seen it happen for two, two decades. And mm. now because of the high freight rates, people are forced to look at other ways to, to move their cargo. And it, it, similar for for cocoa products and, um, and cocoa beans yeah so there's more risks right in break bulk shipping um is there what's the capacity like for for break bulk is it is it easier is it more available is it, um, or is it just the, cheaper the, well it's a volume game 10 20 000 metric ton the risk is is higher but if you know what you're doing the risk isn't that high it's, okay depends you know how you look at it yeah, super. Try to get sorry. Try to get space in your space on the vessel for the equivalent number of uh, of containers. That's yeah, huge risk. You might not get it, and then your cargo is stuck. You get demerged, detention. God knows what. That's How would you handle it? Somebody came to you and said, um, "Look, I've got to get my. I want to get my my beans." Uh, what's the best way of doing it? Would you recommend break bulk, or does it depend on their risk appetite or different situation circumstances? What would you What would you say to them? No, instantly, interestingly, for cocoa beans going from Africa to Malaysia, it doesn't make sense to do break bulk, in our opinion, at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Steph Stephanie can uh, can enlighten us a bit more on this. Go, go ahead, Steph. You're muted, go Stephanie. Which which trade lane should enlighten in? <laughs> Africa to Malaysia. Africa to Malaysia. Uh, break bulk. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so we've recently been working on a 10,000 ton inquiry um, from Africa over to Malaysia. Um, and what the feedback that we're getting from the charters is that there's just not the appetite there for this small tonnage. Um, they've got they've got higher vessels um, for metals and um, other other goods, basically not soft commodities that the higher 30,000 ton vessels for, and they're just not interested in 10,000 tons. So the best way to move into those trade lanes would be by containers because we've been trying for over two months now to try and get a bite on a, on a vessel. And there's just no charters that are interested in the low tonnage such as 10,000 tons. It's just not worth um, doing for them. Fantastic. Listen, I'm very conscious of the time. We've got two minutes left. I don't think there's probably enough time to field any necessarily any more questions. I think there was uh, one or two more questions in the chat room. But what we'll do is we'll pass those, uh, we'll pass this across the panelists, and we'll make sure that uh, people who registered maybe get um, get an answer to those questions that we weren't able to field today on the call. Uh, so I'm going to pass it back to Shirley, the uh, the Maestro organizer, and to wrap it up. And I'd like to thank the panelists. I think it was a really interesting discussion. I learned a lot. And uh, and I thank very much for everyone attending as well. Thank you, Nick. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, thank you, panelists, for a very exciting discussion. If you look at the questions that came in, right, in view of time, I love what Nick said, we couldn't respond to every one of them. You can actually still email them to us at this email address. If you have your phone ready, you can also scan the QR code and uh, connect with us by email right away. Okay, um, I'd like to use this, uh, I'll give uh, everyone, okay. So many of you would have also received the information about the CA International Cocoa Conference happening in September. Uh, if you have not, now you know. Um, uh, we hope to see everyone there and here's where you can find more information about the conference. Uh, scan the QR code on the left for more details and then the right one to register your interest. 
This is a biannual event conducted by the CAA and it's an in-person event finally after two years um, of being in the fridge, we are out. So hopefully, hope to see everybody in person in September in Singapore. Uh, now, okay, the time now is uh, exactly 4.30. Thank you, Nick, for keeping the time. Uh, we have now come to, uh, almost come to the end of the webinar and we trust you enjoyed the session as much as uh, the panelists and we did. Okay, I'd like to take the uh, time to also thank our distinguished panelists for their sharing. And most importantly, for all the participants who are joining us today, I understand some of you had some initial technical difficulties. I do apologize for that. And I'm very glad that all of you could make it. Um, the recordings will be shared, will be shared with uh, all the participants. So uh, not to worry. And if you've missed the first part, we will make sure that you, you get to listen to the whole uh, webinar. OK, so with that, thank you very much again for everyone for um, for joining and uh, stay safe.